Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is lesson number 13 in an interesting series entitled Oneness in Christ. This particular lesson is entitled Final Restoration of Unity. Now you could guess where that might take place, but um, this is the lesson for December 29 of 2018. And I think we're going to find it very, very interesting. I did. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as we contemplate the wonderful plans you have for us in the future, may we be inspired, may those who listen in be inspired to look forward to that day, and may it come soon as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. It has been estimated, and I don't think there's too much question about this, that the second coming of Christ is discussed more than any other topic in the New Testament. But it's probably almost certainly true, and I don't think there would be too much question about this either, that those disciples thought that Jesus would return within their lifetime. Paul kept talking about, you know, we who are remain and our, you know, will be carried up and so forth like this. Well. The, the, the point, I guess, that we should make there is that it's quite clear that there was no reason for Jesus to come the first time if he doesn't plan to come back. Well, God has made promises, and those promises are, are, are phenomenal when you think about it. We just heard from somebody recently that there are 76 wars going on in the world right now. 76 wars in different places. Well. God promised us a place where there are no wars, no famines, no disease, no tragedies, or any other evils. Can we even imagine that? Well, at the time of the second advent, Jesus, the Father, and the Holy Spirit will all appear accompanied by every angel from heaven. What, is, what, what information do we have about that? Do you remember? It says 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's a lot of angels. It will represent the grand finale of trouble on this earth. In fact, the way you know, can know for sure it's the real Jesus, the entire sky is going to be full of bright shining angels. If it's not, it's a fake. The devil will not be allowed to reproduce or duplicate the manner of Christ's coming. I'm sure he would love to do that, but he will not be allowed. So that's a little clue about how you know if it's the real thing. Well, unless we believe Satan's lies, I hope we don't, that, and his lies are that God is a liar, the second coming of Christ is an absolute certainty. And there are some, a lot of verses in the Bible about that, but Kerry, I think you have one, one of the big ones. Yes, this comes from the Good News Translation. I think most of us will re recognize it. Do not be worried and upset, Jesus told them. Believe in God and believe also in me. There are many rooms in my father's house, and I am going to prepare a place for you. I would not tell you this if it were not so. And after I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to myself so that you will be where I am. Very good. Try to imagine what it will be like to speak to God face to face. Adam and Eve did that on a regular basis. And that privilege is going to be ours again. Not only the Father, but the Son and the Holy Spirit. And there will be no possibility of any future troubles to worry about. Well, review why the... Do, why, why do we say it that way? That there's no possibility? Well, I suppose we, we should say theoretically it, there's a possibility. Well, the reason the, I say no possibility because the Bible says it won't happen. There was, I understand that. I'm not arguing. The, the question is, is God running his universe any differently no. then than he d did clear back when he started to, to create intelligent creatures? No. Is, is, isn't love the way he operates the universe? Yeah. The point is that the example of what has happened here on this earth As will be such a shocking <laughs> point that mm -hmm. no one would dare to try it again. Well, think about the experience of the disciples. Imagine yourself as one of the disciples that followed Jesus around Judea, Galilee, 
Samaria, Perea, and so forth. And then imagine yourself, okay, Jesus is gone now, and you're headed for India, or you're headed for Europe, you're headed for Turkey, whatever like this, to spread the gospel because you're very anxious to Jesus, to see Jesus come back. What kind of a contrast would there be in your mind between those two situations? Is it any wonder that Paul wrote in Titus 2.13, as we wait for the blessed day we hope for, when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will appear. Well, as we look back over the prophecies and rearrange them based on when they were first given, as opposed to when they might have appeared in, in the text, we notice that Jude 14 and 15 talk about a prophecy that predates any other prophecy written in the Bible, unless you consider Genesis 3.15 a prophecy. Margaret, I think you have those words for us. Yes, this is Jude, Jude 14 and 15 from the Good News Bible. It was Enoch, the seventh direct descendant from Adam, who long ago prophesied this about them. The Lord will come with many thousands of his holy angels and bring judgment on all to condemn them all for the godless deeds that they have performed and all the terrible words that the godless sinners have spoken against him. This wow. is Enoch talking, and I'm looking at that saying, my, he's only a seventh generation down, and the world is in a desperate situation. Yeah. You take his words. God Amazing. Was, the things they did, and they were close to Adam. The Garden of Eden was still there, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And people could go. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the thing, the thing I, the, that blows me away, this is a quote from the book of Enoch or more or less from the book of Enoch. There are actually four books claiming to have been written by Enoch. Of course, there are no books actually written by Enoch, but four claim to have been written by Enoch. But the Bible quotes this as if it was a fact, it, it, and apparently it is. And I mean, I don't have any question about that. The question I have is, how did that, uh, uh, um, now I can't think of the way. The, How did it get into the, that, other book? that other writing? But what? I'm, I'm yeah, not apocryphal. Later. It's a, a, pseudepigraphical is the word I'm trying to think of. How did it get into that pseudepigraphical book? If there wasn't some truth in the apocrypha and the pseudepigrapha, who would believe them? So yeah. they, there has to be some truth in them. It's yeah. just that it's mingled with error. It's important to know that even well the Jewish leaders even before the first coming of Jesus, applied these words of Enoch to his first coming. They were certain that all those verses, I mean passages, in the scriptures and in some of these other books that talk about he's going to come with vengeance and he's going to clean things up and so forth, they were sure that was going to happen at his first coming. Mm -hmm. So it must have been a well-known phrase that, mm -hmm. that was used. Mm -hmm. I see saw a, a movie title that I never went, you know, I didn't see it, I don't know, but it, the, the, the title. Per perverseness of it caught my eye it was Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer. Now, I suspect that if you've watched the movie, there's probably some factual things to ground the story and say, oh, yeah, this is Abraham Lincoln, which they got from another source. And then, then they, of course, they go, they probably go way off the back, but <coughs> but I see uh, this much the same thing, yeah. and I think we need to be careful because Paul said uh, warned them not to pay attention to Jewish myths, and so these some of these epigraphal books were were uh, based on a lot of Jewish myths, uh, you know, like having multiple archangels, for instance, whereas in Scripture it's all archangels only mentioned twice, once in First, uh, First Thessalonians 4, when Jesus descends with the voice of the archangel, and in Jude, where he, uh, Michael, uh, the archangel, argues over the. It's the also body mentioned of in Daniel, in the mm -hmm. Old Testament. Well, if, yeah, uh, if, you, if you found it. I, yeah, but those are the two that I found from the concordance. Maybe it was a different yeah. translation. Yeah. What seems clear, and, and this I think is important for us to know as we look at Scripture, 
Apparently no one in the Old Testament ever had the idea that there was going to be a second coming. They thought everything that had to do with God's coming and fixing things and so forth is all going to happen to the first coming. Furthermore, in the same way, there's no evidence in the New Testament that anyone knew that there would be a third coming until after A.D. 90 when John received the vision we have recorded in Revelation 20. So Paul didn't know about it, Peter didn't know about it, Matthew, Mark, neither of the Jameses had any idea about a millennium or about a third coming. So why would God, I mean, he has all these prophets, why would he hide that kind of information? Well, when Jesus was ready to leave, he said, I have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. Yeah, they're um, just not ready to receive that yeah. much information. What if there's really a fourth coming? <laughs> we know about the second and third. Yes. Well, if everything happens that we are told is going to happen in the second and third coming, there's not going to be anything left to happen in the fourth coming, I don't think. It reminds I, I'm me just of, saying that as, you know, as comparison to the Old Testament people. Reminds me of Einstein's statement, if you remember it. Um, someone came to him right after they had set off the first um, hydrogen bomb. And after World War II, of course, it was two of those two atomic bombs. And, and then there came the hydrogen bomb with such enormous power, even more than the, than the, the other nuclear bombs. And they asked him, well, uh, what kind of weapons do you think they'll use in World War III? He says, I have no idea, but I can tell you what they'll use in World War IV. Rocks. That was his... That was his... That was rocks and arms. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, the first coming of Christ was clearly predicted in these verses, and, and, and mentioning Genesis 3.15, Micah 5, 2, Isaiah 11, 1, Daniel 9, 5, and 26. And it occurred, just as, it, just as predicted. The second coming is also clearly predicted in the New Testament, in Hebrews 9, 26, and 28. So let's look at a few of those verses. Um, Jim, I think you've got Genesis 3.15 there. Right, from the New <coughs> Good News Bible. It says, I will make you and the woman hate each other. Her offspring and yours will always be enemies. Her offspring will crush your head and you will bite her offspring's heel. Now that's an interesting verse because is he talking to the serpent or is he talking to the devil? Is this just the translation? I don't remember that. No, bite, that bite her offspring's heel. Yeah, well, it, it's same it's, thing. Yeah, bruise. I think a bruise. It might be bruise, in the so yeah, it says in the King James. Yeah. Yeah. Non-lethal wound. Yeah. yeah. I assume does, that offspring it, just means their followers. Well, not, serpent, not serpents actual. have offspring. Well. Was he talking to the serpent or was he talking to the devil? Ah, well, the devil. <laughs> but the serpent doesn't have a heel, does it? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Does the devil? Getting down. Well, well. Jesus spoke of uh, people being of your father, the devil. Yeah. So yeah. there's that use of the That father. idea, yep. Was the son of perdition and had the spirit of evil. Gordon, I think you've got the next one for us, Micah 5, 2. The Lord says, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, you are one of the smallest towns in Judah, but out of you I will bring a ruler for Israel whose family line goes back to ancient times. So what does it mean to say whose family line goes back to ancient times? Is that talking about David and all the way back to Abraham and Abraham. back to Adam? Well, there's a story told about an elderly black preacher who was describing the encounter between Jesus at age 12 in the temple at Jerusalem and the Jewish leaders. You remember that story. Well, let's just look at that real quick. Luke 2, 46 and 47. As soon as I can get my cursor to come up here. When the human race... Oh boy, no, it didn't come up what I wanted. Hold on, let's try again. On the third day, this is his parents came back looking for Jesus. On the third day, they found him in the temple sitting with the Jewish teachers, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his intelligent answers. Okay? So these are the university professors quizzing a guy who's 12 years old. The pastor, this is my black pastor that I'm talking about, the pastor imagined himself hearing this question from one of the Jewish leaders. Son, how old are you? Jesus hesitated only briefly and then said, well, 
On my mother's side, I'm 12 years old, but on my father's side, I'm older than time. <laughs> <laughs> I had to, I had to chuckle, chuckle when I heard that one. Well, in light of all we, have been, we are told about our future and the second coming, we recognize that the times will not be easy between now and then. But we have the blessed hope that when Jesus arrives, the future for his faithful children will be beyond our wildest imagination. So what do, what do we know about the future home of the blessed? Well, let me just read you a few verses from Isaiah. Now, of course, remember, these are verses that the Old Testament people would have applied to Christ's first coming. The lame will leap and dance, and those who cannot speak will shout for joy. Streams of water will flow through the desert. The burning sand will become a lake, and dry, lake, and dry land will be filled with springs. Where jackals used to live, marsh grass and reeds will grow. There will be a highway there called the Road of Holiness. No sinner will ever travel that road. No fools will mislead those who follow it. No lions will be there. No fierce animals will pass that way. Those whom the Lord has rescued will travel home by that road, and, and so forth. It's interesting to note that here in Isaiah, we have one verse that says no lions will be there, and we have another verse that says the lions will lie down with the lamb. How, how can that both be true? No fierce animal that will harm you will be there. Okay. So you're going to do a special interpretation of that yes. verse, huh? That, Don't want to be that, too literal. That's my, that's my that's my interpretation. Okay. <laughs> well, the earliest accounts of man were of Adam and Eve living in the har in harmony with angels and with God in the beautiful Garden of Eden. There was perfect harmony and trust among all present. But unfortunately, the devil demanded access to these new creatures. And so in order to protect humans, Notice I said to protect humans, God gave the devil access to them at only one tree. The devil wasn't allowed to chase them all over the garden, around behind every bush and around every you know, tree. No, this is your one tree. So and then he warned Adam and Eve, stay away from that tree. Yes. So it was to preserve God's reputation of having a universe of free choice, freedom and free choice, and to protect yeah. humans, that uh, that tree, that one tree, that one location was available for Satan to uh, interact with them. God refuses to run a, a universe where there's, where, there's no, a, where there's a minimum freedom or where there's no transparency. <clears throat> Everybody has their chance. Well, we know, unfortunately, he was deceived by the serpent, ate the fruit and offered it to Adam, who also ate it. But while the story of the fall recorded in Genesis 3 was a terrible disaster, the final chapters of the Bible, Revelation 21 and 22, and we would encourage you to read that when you have a moment, teach us that this earth made new will be restored more beautifully even than the Garden of Eden. It is very important for us to recognize that these new heavens and new earth are real places. We will know the people that we have known on this earth who are there. This will never be some kind of existence as is commonly portrayed in the popular press with people sitting on clouds and playing harps. Now, it doesn't mean we won't play harps. We will play harps, but not just floating around on clouds. There will be beautiful animals of all types living, in pe living peacefully together. No animal will ever cause harm to any other animal, to any human being, or any angel. In fact, there will be no more crying and no more death. And we have a, word, we have a, a verse for that. And Dennis? Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4 from the Good News Bible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared, and the sea vanished. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready, like a bride dressed to meet her husband. I heard a loud voice speaking from the throne. Now God's home is with human beings. He will live with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. He will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things ha have disappeared. So Ellen White had some wonderful words to say about that future paradise, and Jim? As the years of eternity roll, they will bring richer and more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will reverence and happiness increase. 
The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of his character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and of the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransomed beat with stronger devotion, and they sweep the harps of gold with a firmer hand. And 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. Ellen White, Spirit of Prophecy, Book 4. Have you ever tried to imagine what it would be like, you know, sometime, uh, I remember being at a general conference one time when there was like 2,000 people in the choir. Imagine a choir with 200,000 angels. Just beyond belief. Well, the best part of that future kingdom is the fact that we will be able to get to know the Son, the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Remember that the basic characteristic of each of them is love. We need to practice that kind of agape love here so we can be prepared for what is coming there. Well, look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. This is a very important passage dealing with the second coming. Our brothers and sisters, we want you to know the truth about those who have died so that you will not be sad, as are those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will take back with Jesus those who have died believing in him. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet uh, the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then, encourage one another with these words. Certainly that should be an encouragement. This is a brief but fairly detailed description of the actual events connected with the second coming. The righteous dead will arise at the sound of the voice of the archangel. Michael, another name for Jesus Christ. And how do we know that Michael the Archangel is another word, another name for Jesus Christ? That's from Daniel, isn't it? Well, well it did, I looked, if you're talking about Daniel 12, it just says Michael. It doesn't say Archangel yeah, there. That's true. Uh, but if you take those two texts, this one with the one in Jude, and mm -hmm. you also look what Jesus said, that, that those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, will hear my voice and wake some to everlasting. Well, if you, you take this and you put it along with John in the Gospel, John 5, 28, I think it is, and one place it says the voice of, of God, the voice of Christ, and the other place it says the voice of Michael the Archangel. So you put those two together, it's talking about the same event. Well, Christ... Um, Together with those who are righteous and still living on the earth, all will rise to join Jesus in the clouds, Matthew 24, 31. Further details about what will happen at that point are found in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53, and I read, Listen to this secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall all be changed in an instant, as quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised, never to die again, and we shall all be changed. For what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal, and what will die must be changed into what cannot die. Imagine the wonderful experience of reuniting with those close friends and family who have passed on because, because of disease or age. I just had an in incredible experience just this afternoon. I have, there's two people in our family that are, I guess you would call them retired, semi-retired anyway, and they have taken up this job of trying to trace the family's history and find the old pictures and all kind of stuff. For the first time in my life, I have an uncle who married, as it turns out now I know, a beautiful young woman while he was in college. She died of something, I don't know what she died of, two years later, and then she re he remarried sometime later, the aunt that I knew. But here was a beautiful young woman that, whose life was cut very short, and hopefully she will be in the kingdom and we'll be able to see her again. An aunt that I never knew. Didn't even know her name. Well, when these people arise, they will arise in a perfect sinless condition. Sin defaced and almost obliterated. I'm sorry, that's yours, Carrie. Yes, okay. 
This uh, is from Mrs. White and the Great Controversy. Sin defaced and almost obliterated the divine image, but Christ came to restore that which had been lost. He will change our vile bodies and fashion them like unto his glorious body. The mortal, corruptible form, devoid of comeliness, once polluted with sin, becomes perfect, beautiful, and immortal. All blemishes and deformities are left in the grave. Restored to the tree of life in the long-lost Edom, the redeemed will grow up to the full stature of the race in its primeval glory. That's from Malachi 4.2. The last lingering gra traces of the curse of sin will be removed, and Christ's faithful ones will appear in the beauty of our Lord, our God, in mind and soul and body, reflecting the perfect image of their Lord. O oh, wonderful redemption, long talked of, long hoped for, contemplated, with eager anticipation, but never fully understood. Wow. Well, of course, the question might arise when you listen to something like that. What kind of bodies will we have? When Jesus returned to speak with the disciples on the evening of Resurrection Sunday, he did what? He ate food. He ate food. They were able to see him and touch him. He told, what did he say to Thomas a week later? Come and touch my side, feel my hands, right? We will have bodies just like that when we are resurrected. Now, they're not going to be like the bodies we have here completely because we know, at least I don't think so, we'll be able to travel infinite distances almost to visit other parts of the universe in almost no time. And how, how of course, we don't know how that happens, but it's not going to be with this kind of body. Star Trek has well, nothing well, on us. The angels can do it. Yeah. And well, uh, somehow we're because we're sinful beings, God made sure that we couldn't. Yeah. First Corinthians 15, does Paul's description of a spiritual body have any relevance to what we're alluding to here? Yes, possibly. Um, the, the thing that comes closest to helping me understand that is, is the story in, in Daniel 9, where the angel shows up, Daniel has been praying fervently to, for an explanation of what was written in Daniel 8, which is a very important thing for us as a Seventh-day Adventist. And suddenly the angel appears to him, and he says, when you begin your prayer, God sent me from heaven. And, you know, the prayer, even though we may not have all of it, that prayer was, what, two and a half or three minutes long? He came from heaven to earth in two and a half or three minutes? Well, obviously that's way beyond any kind of transportation that we know about. The speed of thought. The speed of thought, there you go. Well, there have been great efforts by some people, including some Christians, to try to explain away all the miracles of the Bible. It just natural events. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a volcano that goes off at just the right time, and there's a, a wind, a massive wind that comes up and blows back the the Red Sea and, you know, this kind of stuff. But I can tell you that the second coming of Christ is beyond any possibility of natural explanation. It will be supernatural in every respect, with people popping out of the ground all over the place, having new life, perfectly healthy, people who died and went to the grave, perfectly healthy. No, there's no, no natural explanation for any of that. Well, look at a couple of places, in, in one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament that might give us some relevance. Isaiah 65, 17, the Lord said, I am making a new earth and new heavens. The events of the past will be completely forgotten. And then we read in the New Testament, Revelation 21, 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth disappeared and the sea vanished. Why would it be necessary for God to completely make a new earth and a new heaven. Is this place so polluted and so forth that he just has to... Wax is all like a garment. It's yeah. undergoing decay. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's not like he intended it in the first place. So. And, that's even be and this is even before the last plagues, which yes. will probably wreak havoc on it. Yeah. Well, can we even imagine the city described in Revelation 21 
verse 2 and then 9 through 27. Let me just read some of that to you. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared and ready like a bride, dread, dressed to meet her husband. And if you drop back down to verse 9, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to me and said, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The Spirit took control of me, and the angel carried me to the top of a very high mountain. He showed me Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven from God and shining with the glory of God. The city shone like a precious stone, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates and with twelve angels in charge of the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of the people of Israel. There were three gates on each side, three on the east, three on the south, three on the north, and three on the west. The city's wall was built on twelve foundation stones on which were written the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who spoke to me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. Um, I don't know, but usually we say that those twelve foundation stones are going to be named after the twelve disciples. And of course, I don't know whether that, obviously Judas is not going to be there. You think any of, I mean, try to imagine what Peter and Paul and those people, I mean not Paul, but Peter and John and James and so forth, the original disciples, what, what they will say when they see their names on the foundations of the, new, of, the, of, the, of the new Jerusalem. Mm. I just, anyway, the city was, was perfectly square, as wide as it was long. The angel measured the raw, city with his measuring rod. It was 2,400 kilometers. That would be about 1,800, 1,600 miles. And was at, as wide as, and as high as it was long. So is this a complete cube? The angel also measured the wall, and it was 60 meters high, according to the standard unit of measure which he was using. The wall was made of jasper and so forth and so forth. I won't read the rest of it. Beautiful stones make a part of that. Phenomenal. So what do you think? Is the city going to be a cube that we can sort of move, move into and out of like that? Or, or is he just saying the wall will be in, in proportion to the size of the city? I mean, how, big, how tall a wall do you need? Even if the, if the city is maybe 1,500 miles in each direction, how tall a wall do you need? And what do you, why do you need a wall at all? Yeah, I was going right. to just ask that. Why, why do you need the wall? Probably a metaphor for that was what people needed back yeah. there, back in the Bible times, to the protect safety. them. Yeah. This is safety. Mm -hmm. Do you realize how much, how far 1,500 miles on each side is? Halfway across the United States. Yeah, and north-south, it's way beyond uh, the northern border from the southern border. It's going to be a lot of redeemed then. Yeah, yeah. No, that's and that's just our city home. That's just a city home, right. Yeah. Well, each of us will apparently have a home within the city as well as one other place outside the city where we can grow a garden or develop a property in whatever way we see fit. Well, look at Revelation 22, verses 1 to 5. Again. As soon as I can get my cursor to wake up here. No, oh, that's not what I wanted. Shall I read it while you're doing that? Yeah, I got it. Okay. The angel also showed me the river of the water of life, sparkling like crystal and coming from the throne of God and the Lamb, and flowing down the middle of the city street. On each side of the river was the tree of life, which bears fruit twelve times a year, once each month, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. Now that's interesting. Why do we need that? Nothing that is under God's curse will be found in the city. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face, and His name will be written on their foreheads. There shall be no more night, and there will be no need, of, no need lamps or sunlight, because the Lord God will be their light, and they will rule as kings forever and ever. You ever wondered why they will need kings when there won't be any whatever you would call pe people under a kings in the kingdom? Well, well, Jesus said to him who overcomes, I will be able to sit with me on my throne. Okay. This is, as I overcame and sat down on my father's throne. Well, you know. There can um, be an organization. Yeah. You know, there are, there's a Christian church that claims that each one of us will have a world and will be king over that world. Mm -hmm. um, that's um, probably a bit of a stretch. To call, so, uh, call that church a church, uh, yeah. a Christian is a stretch. 
Yeah, maybe. So to, the, ru to rule as kings is, uh, in my interpretation, that's again, since there won't be any subjects to the king other than question. God the king, um, does that just mean that we will live a, a wonderful life? Yeah. Well, Jesus said the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over you, but it shall not be so with you. That he that would be first among you, the servant of all. So mm -hmm. these are people who are capable of serving more yeah. than other people might, based on their response to God's grace. Okay, here's a question for you. On either side of that river is the trunk of a tree, and who, those two trunks unite together high in the air. Ellen White talks about that. She says she looks and she saw, thought she saw two trees and said she looks up and found out that they came together and united into a single tree high above the river. Here's a, I mean, I've been to a number of places in the world where there's car, cars, big, there's a big enough gap in the, the bottom of a tree where a car can drive through. But a river through a tree and then this tree is going to, its fruit is going to serve everybody and it's, leaves are for the healing of the nation? Well, the tree of life bears 12 kinds of fruit, one each month, and the fruit is for the healing of the nations. We'll talk more about that in a, a little bit. Look at Isaiah 66, 23. Come on now. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship here, me here in Jerusalem, says the Lord every new moon. What does that mean? That's new every month, right? Mm -hmm. It also well, says every Sabbath. Yes. And we're going to have a moon up there, huh? Well, the new earth will have a moon. That, back here. Back here. Okay. Why do people come before the Lord once each month? Is it because the tree of life is about to bear a new kind of fruit? Well, that's a possibility. Is there only one tree of life? Or are there multiple trees of life? Ezekiel seems to suggest that there are trees all along on either side of that river. Look at Ezekiel 47, um, verse 7. Come on, guys. There we go. And when I got there, I saw that there were very many trees on each bank. So, are they all trees of life? And if you're interested in looking at these materials that we use here in our dis discussion together, they're available. This material is available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. But what is implied by the healing of the nations? There will be no sickness there, so why do we not need the leaves for healing? Okay. Okay, the healing of the nations refers figuratively to the removal of all national and linguistic barriers and separation. The leaves of the tree of life heal the breaches between nations. The nations are no longer Gentiles, but are united into one family as the true people of God. What, what Micah anticipated centuries earlier is now being fulfilled. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree, with no one to make them afraid. This is from Micah 4, 3 and 4, and uh, comparing Isaiah 2 and 2, 4. There on the banks of the river of life, the redeemed will invite his neighbor to sit. Zechariah 3, 10, uh, to sit with him, Zechariah 3, 10, with him under the tree of life. The curing quality of the leaves of the tree will heal all wounds, racial, ethnic, tribal, or linguistic, that have torn and divided humanity for ages. This wow. is from Ranko Stefanovic, Revelation of Jesus Christ, Commentary on the Book of Revelation, page 593. Yeah. Isaiah has some very interesting words to say about the future kingdom. Look, for example, at Isaiah 35, verses 4 through 10. Tell everyone who is discouraged, be strong and don't be afraid. God is coming to your rescue, coming to punish your enemies. The blind will be able to see and the deaf will hear. The lame will leap and dance and those who cannot speak will shout for joy. Streams of water will flow through the desert. We read this part of this already. So, and all the animals will be there. And there are other places. Look at Isaiah 66, 21 and 22. I will make some of them priests and Levites. 
Just as the new earth and the new heavens will endure by my power, so your descendants and your name will endure. On every new moon festival and every Sabbath, people of every nation will come to worship me here in Jerusalem. Um, can you imagine a place like what is pictured in these passages? Well, Paul had something to say about that, didn't he? 1 Corinthians 2, 9, you remember? However, as the scripture says, what no man ever saw or heard, what no one ever thought could happen, is the very thing God prepared for those who love him. Wow. There are many new things described as being a part of that new kingdom. New things, a new song, a new name, even a new order of things. Isaiah 42, 9, 48, 6, 42, 10, 43, 19, 62, 2, and 65. Lots of places in Isaiah. The curses that have rested upon this earth as a result of sin as described in Leviticus 26, 14 to 17 and Deuteronomy 28, 30 will be gone. Comment from the Great Controversy 677. There the redeemed shall know even as also they are known the loves and sympathies which God himself has planted in the soul shall there find tr truest and sweetest exercise the pure communion with holy beings the harmonious social life with the blessed angels and with the faithful ones of all ages who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb the sacred ties that bind together the whole family in heaven and on earth. These help to constitute the happiness of the redeemed. Wow. We live in a decaying world where everything is fleeting and temporary. Is it possible for us to even imagine a world where a flower, even though it is picked, will never fade? We have it described, so... Yeah. We must be able to imagine it. Gordon, carry on over there. Revelation 14, 13. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, happy are those who from now on die in the service of the Lord. Yes, indeed, answers the Spirit. They will enjoy rest from their hard work because the results of their service go with them. Well, do these words puzzle to you? Uh, they puzzled me for a long time. This verse immediately follows the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 to 12. So who will die after the giving of the three angels' messages? Are those of us who are living in the time of the giving of those three, three messages going to be treated in a special way in the future? Dennis, I think you've got some words about that. This is from Great Controversy 637, uh, uh, paragraph 1 and some other places. Graves are opened and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel 12, 2. All who have died in the faith of the third angel's message come forth from the tomb glorified to hear God's covenant of peace with those who have kept his law. Those also which pierced him. Revelation 1, 7. Those that mocked and derided Christ dying agonies and the most violent opposers of his truth and his people are raised to behold him in his glory and see the honor placed upon the loyal and obedient. Wow. Can you imagine people who have persecuted God's faithful people down through the generations come up and there's Jesus coming in the clouds just surrounded by a whole sky full of angels. And what will they, Caiaphas for example, after what he said, mm. what is he going to say when he sees Jesus coming like that? How can I be alive? There is no resurrection. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, Seventh day Adventists have. Why am I here? <laughs> yeah, right. Will he realize that he was wrong? I think he already knows. He knew before he died that he was wrong. Seventh day Adventists have chosen to include the word Adventist in our name. Why do we do that? Is our understanding of the Advent different in some way from that of other churches? People in some churches believe that we will be raptured. Others believe that there will be a millennium of peace with headquarters for Jesus in Jerusalem before the righteous are taken to heaven. Others believe that everyone will eventually turn to God and be saved. 
But Seventh-day Adventists, accepting all that the scripture says, believe that there will be seven final plagues in a time of terrible persecution before the second coming. At the second coming, the righteous will be taken to heaven and the wicked will perish and be dead for 1,000 years. What do we call those 1,000 years? The millennium. The millennium. Until the thousand years are over, Satan will be left to live on this earth with his angels to contemplate what they have accomplished. Are you looking forward to the second coming? Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Why? A couple of us are going to get acquainted with our fathers. Mm -hmm. We didn't know them very well when they died. Yeah, that's possible, very true. Well, look what Second Peter says, and I'm actually going to, this says Second Peter 3.13, but I'm going to include some earlier verses. I'd like to start with Second Peter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise. The heavenly bodies will burn up, be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. Now, I guess maybe that's why we need a new earth, huh? Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your lives should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. Not delay it, make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the... Now there it says the heavens will be uh, destroyed. But we wait for what God has promised, new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness will be at home. Wow, what a difference. Have any of God's previous promises ever failed? No. While we recognize that there are some of his words were given in a conditional format and were not fulfilled because we or prior generations did not meet the conditions, God's promises about the second coming will never fail. God has nothing but the best possible plans for his faithful children. Would you give some examples of those conditional prophecies? Yeah, uh, there are a number of the old, in the Old Testament, for example, Ezekiel has a huge section that talks about how when the children of, will return to the promised land and there will be a huge temple that has never been built and all the righteous people will live there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, some people look at that and say, well, that's a prediction about the, the, the new Jerusalem, but uh, it's, it doesn't possibly match what else we know about the New Jerusalem. Do some say that's coming with the Jerusalem on this earth in the, fut in the not too far distant future yep. during a time of peace? And yeah. yeah, some people say that, yeah. Uh, there are others. Um, the, all, the whole thing with the children of Israel, if they had done what they were supposed to have done, they would have ruled the world, they would, the gospel would have spread to all peoples everywhere, and there would have been no reason for their nation to be destroyed. That's a huge one. Well, Dennis, I think oh, you're... Jim. Jim. I'm sorry, Jim, next. Isaiah 64, 4. No one has ever seen or heard of a God like you, who does such deeds for those who put their hope in Him. A Good News Bible. Isaiah, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 2, 9. However, as the scripture says, what no one ever saw or heard, what no one ever thought could happen, is the very thing God prepared for those who love him. Also from the Good News Translation. Almost every day or every week, for sure, we hear of somebody here on this earth that comes up with one, some startling new thing that we couldn't have imagined. What do you think God will come up with? I mean, it's going to be unbelievable, the stuff he's got prepared for us. Well, what we see from the Hubble telescope yeah. is, I mean, these and people that were writing in the Bible, they could not imagine anything like what we see. And there's a new telescope. I don't think it's gone up there yet, but going up that's, what, 10 times stronger than the Hubble? What are they going to see? I, the thing I remember about the Hubble telescope that I always just blew me away they, after having basically photographed the whole sky and they saw all, you know, all these things and so forth, you know, just sort of scanning with the Hubble, someone says, well, what's in those places where there's nothing? And so they decided to f focus the Hubble telescope on a spot where there was no stars visible in the first 
you know, panorama of, of everything. They focused on that and took pictures for like two weeks nonstop or something, just kept it right on the one spot. And I forgot what it was. 13 galaxies and hundreds of thousands of stars that were, <laughs> where they thought there was nothing. I mean, we, we're, we don't even have any imagination of all that kind of stuff. Well, have you ever tried to describe heaven in the best way you can, using your own language? You should try it sometime. It's a good exercise. What do you like most about your understanding of heaven? Do you look forward to meeting the prophets of the Old Testament or the disciples of the New Testament? There's a story told, a apocryphal story, obviously, about you know how Peter's supposedly guarding the gate of heaven and so forth. And there was this man who lived in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and this is a place that I think it's every 17 years they have a terrible flood that comes down there and pretty almost wipes out the, the city. And he lived through one of those floods. And so when he arrived at the pearly gate, well, Peter says, welcome, uh, do you have any special requests? Oh, yes. Could you please have everybody gather? I want to tell them about the Jonestown flood. So Peter says, yeah, we can arrange that. So he gets him up there, and the guy gets all excited. Here's a new audience that's going to hear all about his flood and so forth. And so everybody gathers around, and just before he starts speaking, St. Peter goes to the man on the stage and says, you see that man on the front row with the long beard? Yeah. His name is Noah. <laughs> <laughs> Talk to him about a flood. <laughs> Talk to him about a flood. I'll learn about a flood. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, do you look forward to the animals which will be there? And the people? Mm -hmm. And the peace and harmony? And the wonderful fruit? Man, I keep running into new kinds of fruit you know, or new variations of fruit we have just amazing. No matter what happens, we can trust God to take care of us in the end. Try to imagine yourself among the followers of William Miller on October 22 of 1844. Now those of you who are out there in the audience who some, know something of the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church know that that was the, the date of the Great Disappointment. But try to imagine if you had been among that group up in preparation for that day. They were ready to sell property, to support the cause and to give away things of value because they were certain they would see Jesus on that day. How do you think you would have reacted? We know that Miller, despite his careful Bible study, had misinterpreted the prophecy of the 2300 days described in Daniel 8:14, assuming that it would terminate with the second coming of Christ. Instead, we now know that this is an expansion of what it says in Daniel 7, uh, verses 9 to 12 there, where it talks about Jesus coming to the Father in heaven to begin the pre-advent judgment. But instead, um, if you knew for sure what, when Jesus was coming back again, how would it impact you? Would you wait and try to get ready at the last minute? I think we need to be ready every day because we do not know when our last day will be. That's right. We may not know when he comes, but we don't know when our last day could be either. He wants us to be task-oriented, not time-oriented. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, since we don't know, do, is there any reason why we shouldn't do the things which we would do if we did know? What are you doing to help your neighbors and friends and associates at work to prepare for that day? Are we living a life that correctly represents Jesus to those around us by living the hopes living in the hope of the new earth? While we have very little description of the Garden of Eden, it is probably the closest thing we have at this point in time to give us a hint of what things will be like in the new heavens and the new earth. We're told that Adam and Eve and their children came back to the gates of the garden to worship God periodically. Do you think they could talk to the angels that were guarding the gates? Okay, if that's true, Ellen White suggests that, that the, the, the Garden of Eden was not taken up to heaven until the time of the flood. So do you think those skeptics that were criti critical of Noah ever went to the Garden of Eden and talked to the angels there? And if so, what might they have said? I wonder about things like that. Well, the, gates, the Garden of Eden was apparently taken to he heaven at the time of the flood. 
Did those people who scoffed at Noah ever visit the gates of the Garden of Eden? If they did, what did they think? Were they able to talk to the angels who guarded the gates? Well, John's description of the new heavens and new earth in Revelation 21 reflects what was said earlier by Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 60 and 65 and Ezekiel, especially in chapters 40 through 48. Well, what does it mean to say that there will be no sea there? Well, we also are told that there, there is no sea in the new earth. This statement might sound unusual to the casual reader. However, it is possible that the word sea is being used as a metaphor in this passage. In Jewish thinking, the sea symbolically is linked to evil, oppression, and that which is frightening. So let's, let's pause for just a second. Why would the children of Israel think that the sea represents whatever is evil and frightening and so well, forth? Well, the beasts come out of the sea. Beasts come out of the sea, apparently. Yeah, that's possible. What else? They had the sea on their, well, they lived on, on the ocean. Many of them. Many of them. Well, their nation was on the yeah. ocean. Mm -hmm. And those who tried to go out often didn't come back. Yeah, that's also true. And the sea, at least if it's a large sea, never rests. Well, I mean, there are a few places where there's islands around and so forth, and it sort of brings us down, and the, the ocean can be fairly, but, but most places, the, the ocean is constantly crashing, and you know, especially if there's a wind and so forth. And so in many of the ancient nations, they, they felt like the, the, the sea was a symbol of evil. When John claims that there's no sea in the new earth, he is suggesting that there's no longer any reason to fear evil, because all traces of it have been removed. Well, God came down to this earth and walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. Will that kind of experience be possible in heaven? With thousands, even millions, possibly, of people crowding around to communicate with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, will it be difficult for us to have a personal relationship with them? How's that going to work out? I always think it's going to be interesting to get acquainted with your guardian angel. Yes, absolutely. You know, he's not doing nothing. No. He's acting on God's orders for your best interest. Do we want to apologize to him, perhaps? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, it depends on what you don't, don't, don't answer that. Don't answer that. I speak. I'm just <laughs> being rhetorical at best. Okay, well, we're <laughs> running out of time. Will we be able to travel to other worlds throughout the universe that are inhabited? Yeah. What will those journeys be like? We, we, I, Isaiah 11, along with 75 and so forth, talks about heaven, and we've run out of time. I would encourage you to go there yourself and see it for yourself. Our kind and loving Father, the promises we have, as, as, as tiny really and just few as they are, are still almost beyond our imagination. We look forward to that day and we hope that the difficult times between now and then will pass quickly, that we will be, we will be preserved and soon be able to greet you and meet you as you come in the clouds. We pray these things in the name of that precious Savior of ours, Jesus Christ. Amen.